Friends, we welcome all of you here to uh, this uh, lecture today by Professor Handley. We're grateful to, that you all braved the, uh, the rain to be with us. I'm Spencer Fluman, and I'm the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at BYU, and I'm pleased to, uh, to get us started today. We're going to begin with an opening prayer. That prayer will be given by Dr. Janice Johnson. She's a research associate at the uh, Neil A. Maxwell Institute. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for the rain, and we are thankful for the beauty of that creation. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here and to listen to one of thy disciples. Please help us to consider ourselves, um, those things that we hear today, and how they might apply and affect our lives. We love thee and are thankful for all the many blessings that we have and the opportunity that we have to expand in our, in our minds and have our minds be enlightened. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. We're uh, filming this event. We'll want you to share it far and wide with your uh, friends and associates. Um, and for that reason, too, we ask that you silence any of your devices that may prove troublesome during uh, George's presentation today. I'm going to introduce George to us and then uh, give him the, the chance to come and present to us. He's also willing to. Um, take questions um, after and until the end of the hour so we're grateful for that as well so keep track of questions if you have them George Handley serves as the associate director of the BYU Faculty Center and he also serves on the advisory board for the Maxwell Institute we're uh, glad to have him in our orbit for sure he's the author most recently of if truth were a child uh, part of the Living Faith series that we publish at the Maxwell Institute, sold at fine uh, booksellers everywhere. Uh, we encourage you, his, his lecture today will work in tandem with that volume. We hope that you have a chance to check it out. Those are essays about the Latter-day Saint experience of faith. He's also written an environmentally themed novel, American Fork is that title. His research and other published work in academia focuses on environmental humanities and literature from the United States and Latin America. I'll add too that uh, uh, George is a beautiful mind and a beautiful soul and we're very grateful to hear from him today. His title, Humanities and Belief, Challenges for Faithful Scholarship. Will you welcome George Handley? Somehow I miss Spencer, didn't get to shake his hand. <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's a very complicated set of curtains back here for magic tricks and such. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm just really flattered that anyone would want to come on such a cold, dr a drizzly day as today. Um, but again, then again, maybe you had nothing else to do since it's not very sunny out there. Um, but I'm grateful to have you here, and I'm uh, very grateful to uh, Spencer uh, as the director of the, of the Maxwell Institute, who has been leading the Maxwell Institute with extraordinary energy and inspiration for some time now. I'm um, also grateful today um, to Blair Hodges, who's not here, but is uh, one of the main reasons why I ended up writing this book. He kind of uh, prompted me to uh, write a book uh, with this title after I had experimented with a blog post uh, with the title. and and then kept nudging me forward. And then Morgan Davis, who's been uh, a great friend and inspiration for many years and has uh, been a great uh, colleague in, on this project. And I'm grateful, too, for uh, colleagues and friends who reviewed portions or the entirety of the manuscript and offered uh, generous praise for it. Uh, to be among such people and to have their support 
makes the life of a writer the most rewarding of careers. The Institute has been, uh, made my life as a scholar and as a Latter-day Saint much richer and more exciting. I don't suppose that good reasoning always keeps people in the church, but a healthy climate of honest and exploratory conversation that is grounded in faith, I think, is indispensable for deeper conversion and deeper joy in the gospel. As a young undergraduate at Stanford University in the 1980s, I needed and I gobbled up every morsel I could find from the Latter-day Saint academic conversation, and this helped me not only to strengthen my faith, but to see my faith as more expansive and more relevant to my learning. And I have to say that the amount of faithful and intellectually rigorous work being produced by Latter-day Saints today is, by contrast, an embarrassment of riches. In today's world of overabundant information and tribalism and perpetual distraction, however, I fear that too few members are aware or are taking advantage of these abundant resources. And I think there's a, a, a genealogy to why that's the case, a longer story than I have the space to explore here, but suffice it to say that by the time I arrived to BYU in the late 1990s, Latter-day Saint thought was out and professionalized scholarship was in. This resulted in the remarkable and admirable flourishing of scholarship at a university primarily devoted to undergraduate education, no easy feat, but it has had the unfortunate side effect of strengthening the impression, and I, not without cause, I might add, that scholars at BYU shouldn't dabble in Latter-day Saint thought because they might get into some kind of trouble or produce poor scholarship and potentially embarrass the church or themselves. And the Math Maxwell Institute, um, uh, and, and I would say meanwhile, in, in the in intervening years, scholars at other universities began to publish outstanding scholarship in Latter-day Saint thought and history and theology uh, who showed that rigorous scholarship and faithful scholarship were certainly not uh, incompatible with one another. And the Maxwell Institute underwent its own transformation in light of these developments, a change that I welcomed because of what it portended for improved quality and range of scholarship, but also because of the prospect uh, for a closer relationship with BYU faculty and students uh, with the Maxwell Institute. And I am still concerned that too many professors on campus are unaware of the excellent work being done by so many to develop Latter-day Saint thought. I have the hope that the Maxwell Institute's influence will extend more broadly and deeply into the general membership of the church as well as into the academic and religious communities of the world. We need a less insular and more rigorous conversation about our faith that builds bridges for the church and better prepares our members for faithful engagement in the world. And so I think it should be obvious by now that faithful scholarship and excellent scholarship um, are possible simultaneously and that there is no excuse for shying away from the project. And I maybe would gently uh, suggest to those of us Latter-day Saint scholars who are not fully dedicated to Latter-day Saint scholarship and we're not necessarily trained in such things that we might consider what the scholarly equivalent of a tithe or a fast offering might be short of complete consecration. I would say that I've definitely felt that God's spirit has unmistakably inspired me to write scholarship that has nothing directly to do with my faith. But the longer I have enjoyed the blessings of this university and this community of faithful scholars, I've also felt impelled to um, leverage that work for more overtly religious and devotional purposes. In my own College of Humanities, I know I, I've talked to many of my colleagues about this, but I, I dream of a time when BYU will be widely recognized for its substantial contributions to such fields as hermeneutics, aesthetics and spirituality, translation theory, philosophy of religion, epistemology, theology, religion and literature, and others. And that's not, of course, to say that there aren't people working on those things here in this college and elsewhere. But uh, I, I just dream of a time when BYU will be nationally and maybe internationally recognized as a leader in those fields because of our faith. And I, I think this will only happen if there is a more intentional ambition to allow the richest implications of our faith to inform how we work 
and develop our scholarly interests here uh, on the campus. I think what's at stake in faithful scholarship is demonstrating that the restoration is not only relevant but indispensable to responding adequately to the biggest questions of our day. The religious life should be an adventure. It should not be boring and a mission of the highest order. Nothing engages believers more than knowing that they are called to do important and vital work in the world. This doesn't require reinventing our beliefs. I have always been of the opinion that there are rarely challenges that arrive at the doorstep of an individual's life or at the doorstep of the church or even of the planet itself that cannot be met with thought and wisdom and insight that already exists somewhere in the world or in history. Most, if not all, of the thoughts worth having have already been had. Most, if not all, of the wisdom ever expressed has already been expressed. Most, <clears throat> the question is where and when. And that isn't to say that originality is impossible. It's only to say that what we are, that we are uh, so profoundly forgetful and wisdom is so easily lost in the shuffle and violence of history and cultural change that recovery, reinvention, and restoration are perpetually indispensable practices, which is another way of saying that scholarship in the humanities can be a vital tool to the restoration and to God's purposes in it. As I attempted to argue in my essay that is in this collection, If Truth Were a Child, Poetics of the Restoration, um, I argued that originality and exceptionalism might be too much of a fetish in both our American and Latter-day Saint cultures, since prizing of originality pretends to be able to afford to ignore what has come before. Perhaps, too, we have simply misunderstood what originality is. Often what we admire as original is only what T.S. Eliot described as a creative and newly orchestrated performance of the voices of the dead. Finding new wisdom, in other words, and artistic and intellectual creativity, even perhaps revelation itself, requires deeper searching into what has come before. Joseph Smith's originality is inconceivable without his lifelong and passionate searching in and rereading of the entirety of the Holy Bible. To reread is one of the root meanings of the word religion. So to be religious, in other words, is to be a passionate researcher and re-reader of what has come before. As students and scholars in the, of the humanities, we research the traditions of men as well as traditions of faith. We mine for wisdom and values that we need today. We, in, re, we reinterpret them and reinvigorate them to test their vitality and relevance in light of current and new challenges. And when done with a deeply rooted commitment to our own tradition, this potentially allows us to see in clearer outline the significance of the restoration and to contribute to the ongoing restoration of all things. I believe this is one reason why BYU believes in the values of general education and in the liberal arts. I worry that our students don't always understand why that's so important, or maybe even their parents. However, in order for the humanities to exercise that needed influence, we need to preserve an honored place for humanities scholarship in our religious ethos and for the associated skills of searching, reading, and interpreting traditions among our members. In this regard, I've been thrilled to see so many of our faculty involved in Education Week and in other public humanities endeavors recently. In order for our work of scholarship to retain its viability and usefulness to our community of faith, however, Elder Holland challenged us to bring Christ into our space as scholars in his recent address uh, to the Maxwell Institute. Rephrasing Jesus, he said, if any scholar hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. The question for the Institute is the question eventually for all humankind. How do we best and most warmly open that door, personally and professionally, and on what do we sup when the sup master is admitted? Will our time and con conversation in the Maxwell Institute and at BYU be consistent in every way with his gospel, his grace, his life, and his loving, persistent plea to come follow me? 
For the vast majority of us who are not affiliated with the Maxwell Institute and who don't work directly on questions of Latter-day Saint doctrine or history or practice, I think with more charitable uh, and Christ-centered searching, we can nevertheless model how to be more judicious in our belief and more believing in our judgment. And it may inspire us to address some of the more pressing questions of our time with needed faithful attention in the ways that I have described. I have felt for the better part of my life, as no doubt many of you do, that the beauty and dignity of lived experience in the Latter-day Saint context is rarely visible or believable to the rest of the world, let alone admirable. Members of my faith sometimes view the intellectual life with similar distrust and see it as strange. My book is indebted to my employment at a university where bridging that gap is not only possible but encouraged. It is also oddly indebted to the uncomfortable and sometimes maddening challenge posed by social media and blogging, which I have done my share of, to learn how to speak sim simultaneously to fellow believers, fellow academics, my family, my ward, and stake members. And something about that challenge has helped me to do a better job of being the same person, no matter my audience, even if my topics and tone uh, shift accordingly. So as a book that is both confessional and colored by my academic training, if truth were a child is a modest attempt to provide the reason for the hope that is within me. <clears throat> Oops, I thought I had the scripture, I do not. Um, 1 Peter 3.15 is where that phrase comes from. I'll read it to you in a second. But I'm told by people wiser than I, a.k.a. Morgan Davis, that these words in 1 Peter 3.15 are the first use of the word, or at least an important use of the word apologia, from which we get the term apologetics. I guess apologetic writing is what I have produced in this book, although I confess that I am uncomfortable with the defensive posturing that is often associated with apologetics. That is not to say that I don't believe we have enemies or that attacks on our faith and on our church should be ignored. It is merely to acknowledge that if we do have enemies or if we are attacked, I presume that the most effective responses are indeed Christian ones, inspired by Christ's injunction to love our enemies and even when necessary to turn the other cheek. Personally, I think truly Christian scholarship makes the distinction between a good offense and a good defense almost indistinguishable and, as Christ's examples imply, subtly more effective than overt opposition. I take it that Jesus is teaching us that whatever our responses, they must be overtly committed to love rather than to fear, and to humility rather than to pride. And I suppose that is what apologetics at its best always was or should be. This conception of apologetics is, I think, substantiated by the entire verse from where these words come from. It reads, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. God doesn't need sanctification, but apparently he does in our hearts. In other words, our feelings for and thoughts of God may not always be pure, even if he is. Our thoughts and feelings for God matter because they either compromise or magnify his potent presence in the world based on how well we as believers articulate and represent him. If one were to judge Christianity only on the basis of the most strident and shrill rhetoric of, of Christians today in America, I think one might be justified in rejecting the whole of it. We should talk of Christ, as we're told in the scriptures often, but Jesus also warns us that the frequency of announcing our belief in him does not guarantee he will recognize us as his, right? Lord, Lord, um, uh, uh, when he says, you, we, have, we have said Lord, Lord, and yet he says, I, I do not know who you are. This is, um, so before we engage in a, in articulation or defense of truth, it seems we must work at purifying our motivations. And the key words here are with meekness and fear. This is a very tall order, and I confess that it is a potentially very arrogant thing to write a collection of essays full of personal experience and opinion and expect that it should matter to anyone else. As I state in my preface, I hope you can forgive me. <laughs> I can hope that like 
Moroni, uh, there are merciful readers who understand that although writing causes me to stumble and to see my weakness, it is also what opens the door to the Lord's mercy. As I wrote in the conclusion of my first chapter, which is entitled, Why I Am a Christian, I said the following, and you can read along. I've got some longer passages that will uh, be coming. When I contemplate what Christ meant when he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there, I am, there am I. And when I think of the men on the road to Emmaus who discovered his presence in their midst as they walked and talked and ate together, I think the burden is on me to see Christ in the countenance of others, to see him in the mundane circumstances of my life. If all I see is weakness or insufficiency, it is not cause for despair, but a challenge and opportunity to be met with the hope that is in Christ. William Blake said that the tree which moves some, some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. By seeing with the eyes of love, I can see the, the weaknesses in myself and others and understand them not as obstacles, but as a cause for wonder that, human as we are, Christ remains among us, working, waiting, loving, and forgiving. So maybe one way to think about Elder Holland's invitation is to imagine that Christ has the power to make weaknesses, ours and those we perceive when we read or when we observe others, a cause for wonder. Our work, in other words, in the humanities could be more invested in redeeming than in condemning ideas. A disciple scholar might ask, where or how might Christ be evident in the particular circumstances of ordinary and diverse lives? Anytime you read a novel about a place you've never been, you can ask yourself that question. How might the broad range of experiences across time and across cultures expand rather than threaten the relevance of Christ's message in a diverse world? Our students need to know that Christ goes with us with illuminating power into other cultures, into different times, and into new ways of knowing. They cannot afford to believe that Christ can't go with them beyond the confines of what they already understand and know of the world. Elder Oaks and President Worthen recently uh, challenged BYU to find ways to use our research to help build the kingdom and to more directly bless our students. I don't think this pertains so much to the kind of research we do at BYU, but to, this, uh, to the way and the reason we do it. Research is not a means to advance our careers, but to bless our students, the church, and the world. This charge has raised concerns that maybe research isn't as central to the church, but as Elder Oaks explains, it really is an invitation to make research even more central. As he says, this does not devalue research, but puts it into the context of our mission, which is to bless our students and to bless the world. <clears throat> so in this effort, we don't need our religious zeal, we, we don't need our religious zeal to get ahead of our wisdom and understanding. Latter-day Saint scholars sometimes prematurely judge a disciplinary norm and imagine a conflict with our faith before testing its potency. In the long term, this can do great harm to the very faith we seek to protect. It is one thing to raise questions and, and cautions, but to frame opposition to something like evolution or to offer a private explanation for a church policy as a tenet of our faith puts our youth and our culture at risk. For that matter, to imply or explicitly teach that a critical posture toward the church and its leaders is the inevitable result of becoming more educated and intellectually oriented serves them no better. Maybe we could think of these as invitations to avoid letting our precious concepts and academic norms get too many floors up the ivory tower where they will lose touch with ground reality of lived religious experience. As I have aged, my patience with the high-level theoretical throat clearing I hear at conferences and the pretense that everything is at stake in such production of phlegm has grown thin. I relate to what my good friend Francine Benyon once said in her remarkable essay, A Large and Reasonable Context, which I first read in the 1980s and which I think captures the spirit of what I am trying to do in my book. Uh, she said, and this was also edited by Francine's here and so is Phil Barlow who edited this marvelous book all those years ago. It was a godsend to me. She said, I, I had seen long years, lives even, spent in proving the internal consistency and logic of systems based ultimately on unexamined assumptions. 
I had seen, too, much effort spent creating human ideas and cultures, including our own, which became the only reality experienced. And this is my favorite sentence. I decided it would be better to start baking good chocolate cakes. Knowing the reality and goodness of God would be enough, and for some purposes it was. I'm not a good baker of cakes, as my wife can attest, but I do relate to this idea that sometimes I would prefer very mundane activities than to the intellectual life of scholarship. As I say in one of the essays in this collection, what I want to suggest is that aesthetic and spiritual experiences teach that understanding matters and it comes, but it doesn't matter most and it doesn't come first. The most painful and challenging times are invariably the most transformative, even and especially when we don't understand. If we refuse to absorb contradiction and instead rush to premature or shallow explanations, we may end up shielding ourselves from Christ's experience of the matter. And as um, Francine Benyon goes on to argue, intellectualism, the, her essay is not an argument against reason, but uh, quite the contrary. Intellectualism and its discontents do not mean that one should live one's life without reason. Reason, and perhaps we can include scholarship, should help us to create a context large enough to capture the depth and range of Christ's love, which is certainly large enough to include all experience and all knowledge, no matter how paradoxical it might seem. So while it is a problem that academia is sometimes woefully out of touch with lived experience, it is also a problem that we live in a society and a church culture that place insufficient value on reading on thoughtful and careful use of critical judgment and genuine dialogue, and on artistic expression that manages to escape the ever-growing maw of our individually tailored and commercialized culture of entertainment, which surely must be among the greatest threats to our faith. The paradox, then, is that I am institutionally supported to challenge the culture that surrounds the institution of the church and that I am to do so by studying the humanities, not despite, but because of my faith. This is no easy balance. Sometimes we are too prone to assume fault on the part of the church and refuse to critique the academy or society. Sometimes we are too prone to lay all of the blame for tensions we experience on this secular and wicked world. Or sometimes we seek to lay low and avoid criticism altogether, as if nothing is in tension at all. In their description of BYU's challenging combination of scholarship and teaching, as well as faith and intellect, my predecessors in the Faculty Center, David Wetton and Alan Wilkins, wisely noted, participants in hybrid identity organizations, and here they're thinking of BYU's joint mission of being a research institution and an undergraduate teaching institution, as well as a uh, institution of higher learning and uh, an institution of faith. Participants in hybrid identity organizations must learn to deal with inherent dilemmas or tensions, many of which cannot be definitively resolved. Attempts to completely resolve the dilemmas by ignoring one aspect of the dilemma, for example, significantly change the nature of the organization and eliminate the benefits of that hybrid nature. We need, in other words, to fully recognize and stay with the inherent tensions of our position as disciple scholars in faithful forbearance if we expect to yield the best fruit. And I, I want to say, I hope what I'm saying isn't just relevant to scholars. I hope it's relevant to all members of the church who are seeking that integration of intellectual endeavor and faithful understanding. In one portion of my book, and of course I should say also my book is not written for scholars, um, although scholars may, may find it readable, but it's, it's written for anybody. In one portion of my book, I argue that belief in revelation obligates me, paradoxically, to live with the tensions of community, however bumpy the road. And this is a, a longer quote. <clears throat> For me, revelation is both personal and continuing, and, as a process, should be both individual and corporate. That is, collectively embedded in our membership in the body of faith. I receive revelation not only alone, but also in a community, and that is probably because it would be selfish to believe that revelation was for me alone. The corporate nature of this enterprise often creates challenges, but those challenges provide one of the restored gospel's greatest blessings. It means checking ourselves against people whose personalities and worldviews don't match ours exactly. 
and this can result in turbulence and conflict, but in such moments, I remind myself that it would be a contradiction to insist on and believe in personal revelation and then be categorically dismissive or distrustful of claims to inspiration by others. And if I believe revelation is possible for others too, it also means revelation is never complete, including my own, and that difference of opinion even on sacred matters is likely, maybe even inevitable. This makes dialogue and collaboration necessary to further winnow and refine truth, which is to say, we need each other. For this reason, I never stop asking questions, and I don't believe my loyalty to the body of the church requires me to give up my search for further truth. Quite the opposite. Revelation doesn't have its fullest meaning unless it is deeply processed and ratified throughout the body of believers. In the church, we are united, unified by the trust that God can speak to us collectively and individually, but our unity becomes the most meaningful and sustainable when we give ourselves and others the time and space to work out our own individual relationship with the Lord, with, to the Word. I believe it is lack of faith that causes us to feel impatient with and intolerant of the inevitable variety of experiences with faith in any family or church community. Unity achieved through coercion and intimidation is not unity, but a cheap and false conformity. Now, I will confess, um, I'm going to show the scaffolding behind my thinking here. I'm highly influenced by this passage from Marilyn Robinson's Im Imagination and Community from her wonderful book, When I Was a Child, I Read Books. She says, since we are human beings, turbulence is to be expected. If the effect of turbulence is to drive me or anyone back on some narrower definition of identity, then the moderating effects of broader identification are lost. Think about sort of retreating into your like-minded camps. This destroys every community, not only through outright suppression or conflict. Those who seemingly win are damaged inwardly and insidiously because they have betrayed the better nature and the highest teaching of their community in descending to exclusion, suppression, or violence. Those of us who accept a historical tradition find ourselves feeling burdened by its errors and excesses especially when we are pressed to make some account of them. I would suggest that those who reject the old traditions on these grounds are refusing to accept the fact that the tragic mystery of human nature has by no means played itself out, and that wisdom, which is almost always another name for humility, lies in accepting one's own inevitable share in human fallibility. The last time I gave a lecture in this auditorium in November, November 11th, 2015, the church had just released, released its November 5th uh, handbook policy change regarding same-sex couples. That policy was reversed just a few weeks ago. Independent of what one thinks of the initial policy or its reversal, the turbulent experience confirms the wisdom of Robinson's call for forbearance and inclusion. Commitment to inclusion and peace rather than to retreat and combat requires focus on our share in fallibility. And it also protects, as she argues, rather than betrays the highest principles of Christian faith. <clears throat> One of the issues I'm wrestling with in my collection of essays is that the problem with truth isn't just the emb embodied, incarnate, and multi-dimensional nature of truth, but the incarnate and multi-dimensional nature of our perception of it. In my title essay, <clears throat> I use the example of the story of King Solomon to illustrate this point. This is a longer quote. The first test of the king's wisdom was a polemic. A child dies. The mother, in her grief, believes she can find a substitute for her living child by stealing another. She and the mother of the stolen child, each adamant that the child is hers, appeal to the king to resolve their differences. Solomon's words are chilling. Divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Didn't Jesus say something similar? Didn't he say we had to choose the truth and forsake error, that we had to find a way to either be with him or against him? How can this be? Sometimes I am, sometimes I am not. Sometimes I find myself wanting what is wrong, or judging the poor, or hating my enemy, lusting after things or people to possess, failing time and again to see and love others as complex, flesh and bone, human beings in all their mystery and wonder. But perhaps if I accept my foolishness and learn trust and love and humility, maybe this is a truer choice 
than expending all of my energy just so that I can assert that I am one of the good guys, that I have already and always made the right choices. The two women face the impossibility of dividing the truth in two. The woman who is blinded by her pain is willing to divide the child in order to persist in her lie. She thus becomes a living contradiction. She is willing to lose the very thing she desires just so that she can have it dead. But that is what she wanted all along, a divided child instead of a living child, a living soul, a body to which she is answerable. A living child cannot be owned, bounded, or kept from others. She was wrong to believe that there could be an adequate substitute for a living body. The woman who knows and loves her child can only see one choice. She must give up the child to the other woman so that it can remain whole and alive. She has the courage. Because she has this courage because all along a living child is what she loved and understood could not be replaced. Her love of the child means she must let go of the need to be right so that she can do what is good. Only in this way can the fleshy, individual, indivisible truth in the form of the child's body be preserved. The cost, of course, is giving the child up altogether. Solomon's attempt to divide the truth tests her mettle and reveals the truth of her love. She is revealed as the true mother because hers is the true love, and so the child is returned. The Christian message of the story is the promise of restoration. Solomon's wisdom is God's mercy, a recompense for sacrificing the pride of being right in order to be good. <clears throat> There's one more paragraph. So it raises the question, with how much more care and humility would we speak and act if the truth were not the result of some game of words or a battle of wills, but a flesh and bone living child, a living soul? What if we thought of the truth as something that couldn't be owned or divided up into broken pieces, but was instead something we had to learn to gather and keep together with love? Maybe all truth in the end is measured against the lives of children. It is worth remembering that a living child is, in fact, the form in which the truth came to us. So we know in part we see through a glass darkly and we risk doing harm to the truth when we underestimate or understate or underappreciate it. But we also risk doing harm to it when we overstate or overestimate or prematurely claim to have more of it than we have. If I am to follow Elder Holland's charge, I think it means that I recognize as someone paid to profess that in professing I run moral risks every time I open my mouth. I cannot assume that the mere fact that I believe in Christ and in the restoration of his gospel and that I intend to speak up for it means that I am now immune to error, even egregious error, even or especially when I am professing about the very gospel I claim to believe in. I must speak up, but my respect for the truth must be demonstrated in my will willingness to avoid dividing it. Jesus warns us repeatedly in 3 Nephi chapter 18 that we are the most vulnerable to fall into temptation when we divide ourselves from others. In this chapter, he is talking about those not worthy to partake of the sacrament, and even those who are no longer numbered among the believers because they have uh, made mistakes and posed some danger to the flock. Despite those mistakes <clears throat> and dangers, he insists that no one should be cast out of our meetings, that the believers should continue to minister to and invite those souls to come and see and feel the living Christ. I'm speaking specifically of verse 25. I don't have the image of it, but it's a beautiful passage. I suppose that we must ask, after the handbook change and after its reversal, how Christian and inviting have we been to our LGBTQ brothers and sisters? How Christian and inviting are we to those who left the church in protest? How Christian and inviting are we to those who defended the policy then and to those who defend the reversal now? How Christian are we toward ourselves for our own doubts and uncertainties? While I'm at it in asking uncomfortable questions, how Christian are we to those who embrace the new direction of the Maxwell Institute or to those who feel betrayed by the changes? To what kinds of temptations have we made ourselves vulnerable by trying to shrink the boundaries of our charity and divide the body of Christ? A Christ-centered apologetics, it seems to me, must at least be humble enough to assess generously all the good and the common ground that we can identify before we feel it necessary to identify error. That is not to say that we shouldn't be engaged in a vigorous debate about truth both within and beyond the confines of our faith community. Such debates are inevitable. 
but to pretend that we can do so by means of shaming or judging or casting doubt on definitive intentions is, according to Christ, to lead ourselves into temptation. Whether we look upon someone as unworthy or even scandalously unfaithful to the tenets of our faith, Christ's mandate to emulate his perpetual invitation to come and see appears to be the same. If we indeed bear our own inevitable share in human fallibility, in Robinson's words, our only hope is in Christ's power to make all human weaknesses strong, ours and those of others. As I tried to show in my chapter on politics and civility, <clears throat> a disciple scholar, like all members, must be vigilant about incivility and judgment. Oh, sorry, here's the beautiful verse that I, I did have here. You see that I have commanded that none of you should go away, but rather have commanded that ye should come unto me, that ye might feel and see, even so shall ye do unto the world, and whosoever breaketh this commandment suffereth himself to be led into temptation. That's about the fifth time in that chapter where he says, do not cast them away. This is a chapter called Politics, Religion, and the Pursuit of Com Community, a really fun topic. It's a raucous chapter. <laughs> I, I've never been so nervous about anything I've ever written. <laughs> For liberals and conservatives both, there is the very real danger of political ideology becoming more centrally important to one's identity and values and relationship than one's commitments to basic Christian doctrine. And what is more fundamental than the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus tells us that our strength does not come from what we know, what we are, or what we possess, but in recognizing what we lack. Moreover, he tells us to love our enemies, to bless those who persecute us. Does this mean we should stand aside in the face of evil and let others or ourselves be abused? Should we become apathetic about justice? Jesus certainly never did. But along with a commitment to justice, our, our Christian duty, it seems to me, should include a careful cultivation of an awareness of our weakness and, what, and of what we lack, even if this runs counter to seemingly every self-affirming and evil-denouncing impulse in a partisan society such as ours. <clears throat> the function of Christian belief is not merely to shore up confidence about moral principles and transcendent truths, but also to accept the challenge that in our earnest devotion to and defense of them, we might at times betray them. We must be on guard, as we are warned in the opening section of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, to avoid walking in our own way after the image of our own God. The possibility of such betrayal shouldn't surprise us. This is a story as old as the gospel itself. God is not to be doubted, but to be Christian, to have Christian faith, requires a willingness to engage in self-doubt. Incivility is often grounded in a worldview that is Manichaean and in a tendency to objectify and dehumanize opponents. It is never enough just to identify error or falsehood. It is not enough to fight or stand up for what is right. We must be as assiduously devoted to overturning the soils of tradition to identify and embrace the good. This is a two-pronged duty. As the Lord commands in section 98, forsake all evil and cleave unto all good. Even though the gospel asks us to sift the good from the evil, we have to be about the work of both forsaking evil and cleaving unto good, or we will do neither. In other words, if we think that evil, uh, <clears throat> in other words, if we think that evil and good are always patently obvious, complete with warning labels and other easily identified markers, and that the judgment to know one from the other doesn't risk the uh, the I'm sorry, am I? Okay, I'm still on the same quote. Doesn't require the risk of experimentation or experience. We deny the entire purpose of the fall. If we always assume the world can be easily divided, we might end up seeing differences as categorically threatening the very fabric and foundation of our community. Differences, however, and even our enemies, are often what enable us to become a stronger and healthier community when we see them as opportunities to learn and overcome ourselves. Maintaining a healthy democracy and building Zion both require finding a way to make diversity into a strength, not a weakness. At this point, you might be wondering if I am advocating nothing but wishy-washy niceness. In all honesty, I was brought up short by these words from Elder Holland. But any scholarly endeavor at BYU, and certainly anything coming under the rubric of the Maxwell Institute, must never be principally characterized by stowing one's faith in a locker while we have a great exchange with those not of our faith. Neil Maxwell phrased it this way, a few hold back a portion of themselves merely to please a particular gallery of peers. 
Some hold back by not appearing overly committed to the kingdom, lest they incur the disapproval of particular peers who might disdain such consecration. And some just hold back, period. This hit me quite hard because it brought back to my memory with some shame a moment in which I held back. Shortly uh, after being hired here, I published my first book, Post-Slavery Literatures in the Americas. The book traced the tragic genealogy of, genealogies of mixed race family lines in slaveholding American nations that facilitated but then condemned such mixing and com compromised their own democratic projects in the process. As a sign of the influence the book was having in my field, I was invited to lecture at NYU to a small but prestigious gathering of scholars of the Caribbean and of the African diaspora shortly after its publication. I was one of the only scholars there who was not of color. I was extremely flattered and honored that my work seemed important to them. My speech was even later published in the magazine Black Renaissance, a gathering of cutting edge voices in the African American community that explored black experience in the arts. I was pretty sure no Latter-day Saint had ever tread that ground before. One evening, we went out to a restaurant, and while we were eating, one professor of Caribbean literature seemed a bit disturbed by my BYU affiliation, which was just a few years old. And from several seats away, uh, she began in front of everyone, she began to interrogate me a little bit about why I was at BYU. I couldn't quite tell what the nature of her objections uh, was exactly. She wouldn't come out and say if it was our priesthood ban of people of African descent or our supernatural beliefs, our views of traditional family or our strong identification with conservative politics that really bothered her. As I struggled to answer her questions, she grew impatient, cut me off, and asked bluntly, but you don't buy all that, do you? I'm still not sure what she meant by all that, but with everyone at the table watching this tennis match, I heard my voice say, no, I don't. She seemed satisfied, and that ended the conversation. I went back to my hotel that night feeling dejected, half expecting the cock to crow. I tried to justify my words by telling myself that she couldn't, she could have been asking, she couldn't have been asking about religious belief, but something more political. But the truth was, I knew that I didn't know that, and that in the end, I had cowered in fear and let not only her, but an entire table of my colleagues think that I was not a believer. So what do I wish I had said? You'd have to read if truth were a child to get the full answer. <laughs> I wish I had said something about why my faith as a Latter-day Saint was central to the work I do as a scholar of racial history in the Americas. Because of our belief in rigorous education, in family history and genealogy, in testimonial language that is ignored by corrupt political powers, because of my own expansive and humbling experience as a missionary in the multiracial and post-slavery society of Venezuela, and my years of inspiration reading a sacred book that includes the entire hemisphere and our understanding of America, that teaches that all are alike unto God and that preaches racial reconciliation. And yes, I could have spoken of my discomfort and disappointment in my church's contribution to my country's racial divide. I might not have persuaded anyone of my beliefs, but I would at least have made it clear that I did not subscribe to her assumption about the incommensurability of my faith in Christ and in his restored gospel and my academic work. Um, Elder Holland urged us to be careful about bracketing our faith lest we fall into such false assumptions ourselves. Elder Holland acknowledges that there is a time and a place for bracketing. One's faith need not an ex be an explicit tool in all of one's thinking or research. I think the bracketing of my faith as I entered into my research on this first book initially allowed me to listen and learn a great deal. However, I was so unprepared to give a reason for the hope that is within me at this moment of truth because in such academic circles, I had been content to pass as the run-of-the-mill secular humanist and was simply not practiced in articulating a more integrated identity. I lacked models of why my theology was related to my studies, and I had not done the work to create any understanding of my own. Lacking such models, maybe I had convinced myself of what this woman, and maybe even some of my fellow members of the church suspected, that moral concern about racism and my Latter-day Saint faith were indeed separate matters. Since 
if truth were a child, today exposes my abiding faith in the restoration fully to public view. I hope you and the Lord can consider it as a kind of penance <laughs> for that mistake and a model, however imperfect, of the integration I once lacked. General authorities deserve patience and forbearance to occasionally get things wrong in their best efforts to do what is right. As an aspiring disciple scholar, I am grateful to be accorded both by BYU, by my church leaders, and by my fellow members some of that same space to experiment and even to fail. Courage or creativity to create a context large and reasonable enough for faith to flourish will be in short supply without such forbearance. There is nothing like the constant and impending threat of impatient judgment to shut down such creativity altogether. I prefer a large and reasonable context that allows, us, allows bad ideas to die of their own weight and that allows the best ideas to gather their own strength. Faithful scholarship is no more likely to get things right than the best attempts to serve others with genuine love but we should at least be giving our best attempts, I think is the point. In writing more publicly about my faith, I've made myself vulnerable to the dissatisfactions of the general membership, church leaders, my brilliant Latter-day Saint colleagues, and my academic colleagues at large. Because my book is an equal opportunity offense for all readers, I take comfort from Elder Holland's words. I testify that he loves you for every good thing you have ever done to help and for every way you are trying to help now. We should not be above criticism, which is why he adds, I also testify that from time to time he will patiently nudge you, giving you course correction regarding anything that doesn't help. I am grateful for those nudges that come from this institution, that come from my obligations of my callings and my covenants, and from the Spirit. I am bound to the gospel and to the Lord, and although at times this causes some chafing, I am better for the work I have done to make good use of suggested course corrections. I am grateful, too, for the high demands of scholarship, for the many hours I have had to spend revising and rethinking because of the demanding voice of a sharp critique. If it is religious to reread, it is also religious to reconsider and to rewrite. Such penance brings redemption, not condemnation of what we essayed or tried, right? That is the root meaning of essay. It involves acceptance of our stumbling as we seek to give expression to what is inside of us and Moroni's, or if you prefer, Prospero's hopeful prayer for mercy. Not all criticisms are warranted, but it is well to remember that no thought, no assertion of conviction is unanswerable to the body of Christ. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes.
Yeah, I, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I mean, I, I've drawn a lot of strength from um, uh, my good friend Thomas Worthlin. Um, I, I think many of you know his work and his book about faith transitions and stages of faith. Um, in my presentation, I was talking about how, you know, Christ is even in the, I mean, I'll just, I don't know if this is an adequate comparison, but when I was studying about the history of slavery and its impact on, on nations in the Americas, I was in totally new terrain, foreign terrain for me. I'd never, I didn't descend from that experience. I didn't um, know very many people who had descended from that experience. I didn't know that context except as a dry contact with books initially, uh, and my experience in Venezuela, I think, had sh um, shaped me. But as I read stories of incredible violence, rape, um, uh, dispossession, dehumanization, I mean, just some of the worst things you, we can ever understand about our American history and the history of the Americas as a whole, um, I had to, I had to sort of keep stretching my understanding of Christ's compassion. And that's kind of what I was saying when I said, you know, we have to help students understand that Christ goes with them into new ways of understanding and new ways of um, seeing the world that they hadn't yet understood before. That's what education does. It leads us out. That's what the, the word means. Um, but hopefully it means that the light of Christ still illuminates where we go, right? I think the, the what I'm trying to do in this book is create enough of a space for that light of Christ and, and in our communities so that when people encounter um, really difficult challenges in their family, with people they love or with themselves, where the narrative that they told themselves about their faith suddenly shatters, that they don't necessarily feel like they have to conclude that Christ shattered and that he's not there anymore, that he can't illuminate this new, this new terrain, right? I mean, we want we want Christ to go with us, and and I think um, I think you know that's very simple advice. It's very easy to give, but it's hard to do. But I, I do think that verse in um, Third Nephi eighteen twenty five really hits it on the head for me personally. Is that my my job as a Christian is to always invite people to come and feel and see the Savior, right? That's that's the focus, and um, and I know that in certain relationships in my life, if I invoke certain doctrines or teachings or practices as a way of inviting someone to Christ, it's gonna shut the door in a, in a, with a door slam, right? But I know that if I, so the challenge then is to say, Lord, what, how do I keep that door open for that person? What is, what is my new way of speaking, my new way of relating to this person that they can still have a chance to come back to the Savior? And I, I think the Savior teaches us just slowly and gradually. It's difficult and challenging, but I think we we just ask ourselves, you know, when I was reading those his, those stories about the history of slavery, I just kept thinking Christ knew every one of these people, and this suffering was known to him. This isn't news to him. Nothing we experience is news. So that's that's my fundamental faith. I just have to rise to that, right? And I think sometimes we just... We shrink it, and we say, well, this is, this is something Christ can't possibly, or God can't possibly have anticipated this problem. I just don't believe that. I don't, I don't think there's anything that he can't have anticipated and suffered for already. So I don't know if that helps. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my sort of playful way of thinking about it. Yes. I mean, I, I, I'm sort of of the conviction that um, 
uh, and maybe it sounds very backward looking and very um, uh, sort of not very adventurous into the future. I was borrowing from the theory of T.S. Eliot about originality. He's talking about poets and he says, you know, what we think of that makes a, a great poet great is that they do something that no one's ever done before. And his point is that's actually never been true. There's no such thing as a poet who's doing something um, that hasn't, at least in some parts and ways, been done before. What's, what's new is the way that the poet is orchestrating those influences and those traditions in a new configuration. That's new. Uh, new languages emerge that same way. They come out of old languages. So it's, it's a sort of understanding that culture um, and originality or newness is actually born out of the sort of gathering of fragments from other, other components. And I think that's what Joseph Smith was doing when he, when he produced The Pearl of Great Price. I think that's what he was doing when he translated the Book of Mormon. I think that's what he was doing when he stood up and announced the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants impromptu. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't coming out of thin air. It was coming from a deep engagement with a text and texts that inspired him, some of which he didn't read or didn't read very carefully. But he was nevertheless trying to sort of find newness in what had come before. And that's really what's, I think, um, really important. I mean, if you think about it, I, I, just, I just have this feeling when I'm reading and I'm discovering something that someone said, you know, whether it's two millennia ago or, or 25 years ago, and I think, holy cow, why did this, why isn't this front page news? Wh news? Why isn't this someplace, why isn't this common knowledge? And it's not common knowledge because we are, cultures are profoundly forgetful. We do, we have libraries and we have the internet now and we have all kinds of mechanisms that we try to use to preserve understanding. But the fact is, books gather dust on shelves all over the world and libraries are destroyed in wars, right? And so there's, the, the story of human history is the story of forgetting. I, I, just, I just don't know why it's true that, you know, those poor people who lived 2,000 years ago don't know all the, all the wisdom that we know now. I think that's an absurd and arrogant position. Um, and it's also, I'm, I'm suggesting that, you know, for all of us, whether we're professional scholars or not, we should be in the business of reading constantly and searching. Um, and often what happens is that it, it changes the way we then read the same text. I mean, you know Revelation is happening when you go to that same chapter in the Book of Mormon or in the New Testament that you've read 20 times before, and all of a sudden the words are totally new to you. And the reason they're new to you is because you've, you've dug something up. It's not because the words are any different. So they're not actually new, but the experience is new because you've brought something new to it. That's how I think God teaches us. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. It has everything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it has everything to do with it. In fact, there is an essay in this collection called The Moral Risks of Reading Scripture where I try to develop this, this whole idea of um, why context matters. I mean, we have, we have a little bit of embarrassment about that, like especially as religious people, um, people who are prone to want to protect the status of a sacred book, want to imagine that reading is always hap it somehow happens without any context at all, and that if it does, it you know, and that therefore the reading or interpretation is sort of slanted or biased or contingent upon sets of circumstances. And we feel a little embarrassment about that. I, I'm, I argue that the restoration actually puts that, that fact of reading front and center and says that's, that's how it works. That's what, I mean, you know, right at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, you see that happening. Lehi has a dream. He interprets his own dream. And his interpretation is that his sons are in trouble. He's worried about Laman and Lemuel. Lehi says, I want that same dream. The Lord gives him the same dream, and he has this much more expansive interpretation about the whole of human history and the, and the plan of salvation. And that doesn't, that's not to say that <clears throat> Lehi's interpretation was wrong. It's just that, and you know, the same thing happens with Isaiah's language, right? Isaiah's speaking to his, he's prophesying to his time, and Nephi's quoting 
Isaiah for his time and suddenly it's taking on a different meaning and then we're reading it and thinking in the 21st century what does this mean and it's taking on added meetings, uh, meanings and I think that's the, that's the essence of continuing revelation is that God honors our place he, he knows that you need revelation at your age that you didn't need at age 20 you know and that, and that, that doesn't mean that what you read at age 20 was wrong even if it's different. I also elaborated a little bit on this with lay clergy. You know, you have one bishop says, I feel like calling Sister Johnson to be the Relief Society president, and the next bishop thinks, I need to call a new Relief Society president. And so, well, was the first bishop's inspiration wrong? Or, the, or you know, that the different people are gonna call, make different callings or g- receive different promptings in, the, in a lay church, and that's just the, the rolling effect of continuing revelation. It doesn't, it does mean that revelation is also always partial. And that's also why we need each other, you know. I mean, it's not, there's no one perfect bishop or there's one perfect Relief Society president. Yes. the golden question yeah I think the answer is in Moroni chapter 7 um, because I think what Mormon is describing is a searching so I think the key is we have to be searching we can't be content on protecting what we already have we have to be engaged in unfolding new understanding so we have to be in the act of searching so that requires risk right we do run the risk of being wrong, and guess what? We will be. We will be wrong a lot of the time. But if we're not, if we're afraid of that, then we retreat and we're, we, we stop searching, right? And then actually the scriptures say we kind of condemn ourselves because we're, we think we're content with what we already have. And that's, that's, that's like, you know, one of the central messages of, of the Restoration and certainly of the Book of Mormon, right? So we are to be a searching people, and that means I think we should be comfortable with the wager that we're going to be wrong occasionally. But Mormon explains how we'll know, right? You'll know by experimentation. And Alma 32, Alma explains how we'll know. We'll know by experimentation. In other words, we can't, we have to be careful about, that. that's kind of why I was trying to express some, um, what I think is caution in the scriptures about prejudgment or bias, you know, that I already know this is wrong, or I already know this is right, and I haven't actually experimented. I haven't actually put it to test. I haven't taken the risk. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at DNC section 9, where the Lord is chastising Oliver Cowdery for not failing to translate the Book of Mormon, and it's a really strange statement because he says you you failed to you you thought all you needed to do was ask me you didn't even study it out in your mind well what is what is he supposed to be studying I mean I don't know maybe historians here know if he was actually looking in the hat or if he was looking on the plates or what he was doing but whatever he was looking at that text wasn't appearing to him as a readable text in English he had he was being told you had to have sort of have thought that it might be something, that it might say this particular thing, and then I would have been able to help you to translate. So he's, he's kind of urging Oliver to say, you've got to have more confidence. And boy, Joseph Smith didn't lack that, right? I mean, he could just stand up and do it, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I suppose um, I mean, 
I think we are commanded to have more forums in the sense that w you and I are instructed to be instructors, right? So a forum might be our class. Um, it might be um, uh, this sort of a, a lecture that's given on campus or whatever that's not part of that formal collective thing. I think the power of those forums isn't just that that's like where the, the most potent truths are taught. Um, I mean, I've heard lectures by people who are not members of the church here on campus that are not part of a forum address that have been as inspiring or more inspiring than things I've heard in a forum address. So I don't, I don't know that there's an exclusive claim there. I think what's unique about those, though, that and important about that ritual of meeting together every week is that it is the whole community. I remember years ago a colleague of um, a friend of mine here, Alan Christensen, invited an art historian from Williams College to come to BYU and visit. And we, he was here on a Tuesday. And we had this middle of the day hour where we had to explain to him what was going on. And we were walking across campus. Uh, so we were not doing, we were not in the forum. I don't remember what it was, but we were hosting him. And he said, what's going on? And he saw students sitting down in the hallways in the Kennedy Center. And, 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 then, we, and then he saw all the students walking uh, to and from the Marriott Center. And he said, what is this? And I said, well, every week we pause and we have this address. And he says, and they're, they're in the, li they close the library. You know, students can listen to it. You can listen to it in your office, but it, everyone's invited to come to the, he just was blown away that this was a community thing, one sacred hour a week where the whole community gathered to listen together. I think that's the power of it. I mean, certainly when general authorities are speaking, that's also a very special opportunity, but I think any address like that is uh, certainly to be taken advantage of. I mean, I think your question's in the same spirit of saying, you know, if we're gonna be reading, I had this crisis of faith, or conscience, I should say, in graduate school when I realized I was preparing for my exams, um, and I was studying like 12 hours a day and taking notes on every book I could read, and I was writing down all the plot lines, and, and then I was like, I'm spending zero time on the scriptures, or if I am, I'm spending a minute and then I'm spending 12 hours reading novels from the Caribbean like that's just totally out of balance so I think I think that's that's our challenge we do have to make sure that our our root contact is 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 strong so thank you yeah I think that's probably good for questions if I'm happy to answer others afterwards but thank you very much thank you.